from Rixie, this is Frameform, a show about movies, moving, and everything in between. I'm Hannah Weber. I'm Jen Ray. And I'm Claire Schweitzer. Hello, and welcome to Frameform. This episode includes a discussion on an exciting new documentary, Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance, plus an interview with the team, Kadifa Wong, Zach Nemerin, and Lisa domal Enjoy. All right, guys, how's it going? It's another Wednesday. How are you? Another Wednesday. Doing well. Doing well. Today we have our fifth episode. We're actually doing something a little different this week. We're going into a deep dive is what we're calling it. Basically looking at one film, one film only. And we're going to just, you know, really look into what the film is about. What is it saying? What is it displaying to the audience? This film today is going to be Uprooted, which is a new documentary by Kadifa Wong. And I am so excited to talk about it. But first, I want to know, what are you guys watching this week? What have you been uh, exploring regarding the, s- the streaming and taking in YouTube, Vimeo, Netflix, whatever? What are you watching these days? Well, I've actually been watching um, the Grounded Screen Dance Festival. It's curated by, I believe it's curated by Claudia Kappenberg, who's based in the UK. And it's mostly like video art sorts of screen dance. I mean, it's totally different than what I see normally, which is which is refreshing. It's like, it's interesting going into some more territory that's not quite familiar to me right now. That's awesome. That's why we have different festivals and curators and perspectives. I love, like, even when there's festivals that have a specific format, like all these films were shot here or shot on this type of technology, like... I just, I I love that sort of curatorial focus. And we're in an interesting time where we can actually like directly compare and kind of receive different curatorial intents, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. Even like what format you're using, because, you know, the choice to do online or how do you do the online screening? Or if you're not just doing screenings, what else do you do? I would call this like a renaissance almost. And I'm interested in what things will will be on the other side of this, like definitely transformed by the this change in circumstances. I watched uh, Castle in the Sky by Miyazaki. Yes. <gasps> oh my God. And the crowd goes wild. <sighs> yes. So good. Oh my gosh. Uh, I've, I'm not someone who grew up watching anime or watching Miyazaki work. I didn't really get into anime in general until I hit graduate school. Um, And when I mean that, I mean like at the late end of graduate school. My friend, he actually texted me the other day because he saw that I logged it into um, Letterboxd, which is an awesome application that everyone should get. He saw that I watched Castle in the Sky and he's like, oh, what did you think? And I'm like, um, it's amazing. I can't believe this was like one of his first films that he made. Like, it's so beautiful. Like, and uh, I've been watching all of his films out of order because my friend was asking me if I was watching it from like, you know, the order of when each was released. And I've definitely have not done that. I mean, I started with Spirited Way, which is also a fantastic one. But now that I have HBO Max, it's just been so nice to like have these access to Studio Ghibli. I mean, like, what the hell? I, this is taking so long to have this kind of access to the United States without having to buy. I've, I'm more of a renter kind of person. So it, I'm just so happy that HBO Max finally can house that kind of stuff. Thank you, Kadifa, Zach, and Lisa for taking the time to talk with us more about this exciting project. We are honored to learn more and highlight what we believe to be an instant classic and seminal work. Hi, I'm Kadifa, and I'm the director of the film. And in my other life, I work in theatre and... um, that's that's it. <laughs> Hi, I'm Zach Nemerin. Uh, I am the original concept guy. Uh, I'm a co-creator. Uh, I did additional choreography for the film, and in my other works, I'm a. I've been a performer for nearly twenty years in the West End and internationally, and I am head of jazz dance at Millennium Performing Arts in London. 
Hi, my name is Lisa Don Malreve. Uh, I was the producer on Uprooted. Um, I started LDR Creative about four years ago. I met these guys three years ago. So we've had a very fun three years together so far. Um, before in my past life, I was a performer, uh, dancer, musical theatre person in England and then in New York. And then we moved to LA. Um, I don't do that anymore. I prefer being on the other side of the camera, <laughs> pulling everything together. So yeah, that's me. So uh, let's actually start at the very beginning. How did this project come to be? And what was the seed of the idea that uh, has become uprooted? As a performer in, in the West End and an emerging choreographer uh, and a teacher, I kind of, I noticed that a lot of our elders were beginning to pass away, actually, because my mentor, um, Jack, the late, great Jackie Mitchell, who actually taught all of us at some point, uh, you know, she passed away and I took over from her at Millennium. And uh, I suddenly realised that there wasn't actually a lot of information about jazz dance out there as a whole. Uh, certainly nothing visual. Um, and I was working in Dirty Rotten Scoundrels, Jerry Mitchell's Dirty Rotten Scoundrels at the time. And uh, I, was at, I was at the Savoy Theatre doing the show. And then all of a sudden, it got to one of my quick changes. And Kadi I was faced with Kadifa, who I've known for over 15 years now. And because uh, we worked together on the original Mary Poppins like years and years and years ago. And I was faced with Kadifa. And I was like, oh my God, oh, so there's me standing there butt naked practically. And uh, just, just doing a quick change. Um, <laughs> and and I and I discovered that that Kadifa had gone away and retrained in filmmaking and in directing, and I really wanted to create something to do with jazz dance, and that's kind of the genesis point, the the the, the real beginning. I, I I realized that there wasn't enough information out there for not only students but for you know us as artists as well to kind of keep on creating and building what has gone on for years and years and years. Um, and and Kadifa started that journey with me, which was wonderful. <laughs> was that a tear, Zach? <laughs> it was a little tear, yeah. <laughs> but no, I mean, Kadifa and I have been on the same page for, for like 15 odd years now. Just, you know, we both come from the dance background and, and uh, we just want to get stuff out there. We want to create and, you know, tell stories. And that's, that's what we are as artists. We're storytellers, aren't we? So. And there's something about dance being a fleeting art form that film just is such an important medium for us to continue that tradition. It's not just like oral history and stories being passed down or movement being passed down. It helps to actually have documentation and... We really appreciate how this film took so much history, had it pretty well organized in a it's mostly like linear fashion. Like I, I can only imagine, I'd love to see like a brain scan of like what it's like trying to plan all this together and deciding where to compress time and expand time. Um, and we really appreciate how many interviews you had as well. I think you said over 70 people were... So in the actual yeah. film, we got to we got to about fifty we got to fifty one interviews over four countries, eleven cities. Um, yeah, it was it was a big feat, and that and that was you know fifty one is just the beginning because actually we've got plenty more. We got up to nearly eighty, yeah. so right. <laughs> but we couldn't use everything. Well, like. I think something that definitely comes across in the film is that there is uh, there's not a consensus. It really is like a survey of different perspectives but they're even at the end there's no final this is what it is and I find that more interesting of course because it's not the film's not telling you what to think it's giving you exposure so you can form your own thoughts um and again I have to apologize I know you've been asked this you're gonna be asked this every time you speak on this film probably but define what jazz is you know where I'm going Define what jazz is for you. How has that definition changed or adjusted over the years or even in the process of making this film? What jazz is to, is to me, I would always say jazz is rhythm, it's syncopation, it's dynamics, it's isolation, it's improvisation. And if it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. I mean, you've just got to, <laughs> you know, if, if it doesn't have rhythm and syncopation and swing, it ain't jazz to me. Love it. 
So no requirement for a la seconde fouettes or side tilts or aerials or any of that. No. <laughs> Absolutely not. And, you know, that's, that's one part of that's what That can be considered one part of it. I love how the film does cover that. It's like, yeah, that was kind of more like comedic dancing and breaking. And there are actual roots there, but it's not, at the, it's not the way that it's being presented right now necessarily. Well, Kadifa and Lisa, was there anything in the process of this film where you, you were heading one direction and you had to pivot? Well, we had it down at the sort of the beginning when we did the research. So before we started filming, we obviously had to do a lot of reading. And the first book I read, which was the Jazz Dancer History of the Roots and Branches that was edited by Lindsay Guarino and Wendy Oliver, that's when we got the first kind of instinct that what we were going to do and what, how we were approaching the history of jazz wasn't what we had come into it. And that's when I had my kind of belief in what jazz dance was questioned. So at the very beginning, we were like, oh, okay, there is a discourse here. And let's make sure that we kind of pay attention to that. And it wasn't until we sort of started filming in New York that I kind of was like, some people are talking about it and some people aren't. So I didn't want to shame anybody that wasn't aware of that because but at that point, we weren't having those honest, open conversations about appropriation, about the roles that race play into that and all of that. So it's not about shaming anyone. It was about, all right, let's get your everyone's interpretation. Let's hear everybody's explanation and then put it together. So, you know, Melanie was was a great interview. But when we actually did that moment, that was actually towards the end of the the whole filming kind of journey. And my editor was like, right, I need to set this in context because she didn't have a way of making that point. And thank God for Melanie kind of just speaking out about it and being able to be direct because it was really hard because we didn't want to manipulate anybody. We wanted everybody to speak their truth as they saw it without us going, so could you... Um, just say something on this or say something on that. It's like, we don't want you to talk about appropriation unless you've got the receipts or unless you are versed in that because then, then it's just opinion and it doesn't become fact. And there's a very gray area between, you know, when you're educating people and you're trying to have this dialogue between someone just going, I think that because I think that, but I haven't done as much research as, as say Melanie or Thomas de France or Monsell have done to be able to give my solid opinion as a filmmaker all I can do is present it to the audience. I think the the my main takeaway from this whole experience to date um, was how I was how I was trained, how I was brought up within dance, was very in the studio codified because I was brought in a up, brought up in a upper white middle class community. Um, I naturally improvised and used to just dance to music to my grandparents or my mom. I'd make up like dances all the time. So I, I had that in me, but I was then put in a studio and couldn't wait and then saw West End shows. So that was my, uh, and I had a very much dancer mentality of do as you're told and be on this number and be the best that you can be. So I, I had a very successful career in musical theatre and that's where my passion was even though I actually did train a lot in contemporary we call it contemporary you guys call it modern so I did a lot, a lot of Graham and um, Alien stuff when I came to New York in my late teens and um, then digging into this now because they came and was like we want to make a documentary about jazz dance and I was like awesome I've never made a documentary before but I know about jazz dance ha ha Let's do the whole thing. <laughs> so you kind of then go, uh, which I knew was the right thing to do, but I didn't really naively know how complicated it was going to get. But that's where it got interesting because every step of the way, then we were discovering new stuff. And, and that I humbly would listen to these interviews and be like, holy cow, I didn't know that. You know, <laughs> I've had professional training. I wasn't told this. I, I then was a professional, you know, had a career in a very small part of jazz, really, as you see it, um, or as I've learned now. And so it's nice to, it's, it's quite humbling. I just, I just feel like I've learned a huge amount. And I would say what jazz is for me is the social and the community and, the, uh, and seeing the impact of the, the change of the music and the impact of what's going on in the world, how that changed it. And that's, that was fascinating. And that's why I'm so 
proud of Kadifa because I was just just was like, make the film that you want to make, just do it. Like again, naive producer. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And then go, how much? Um, <laughs> so it's fine. You always figure it out. But uh, as my dad always told me, who's passed away now, but if you're going to do it, do it properly. So I wasn't going to make some half-assed oh, let's just do it about mathematics because that's Jackie Mitchell basically was in mathematics's um, company. I was taught by Matt himself in France and Jackie. That's kind of where that's again. But as you see in the film, it's quite they call that that's kind of a codified thing, but it served me very well. So I still teach it. Um, it's still relevant. Um, but I think you need to know everything. And I, 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 I'm sad that I didn't know everything throughout my career, but I'm really happy that I now know it. Um, and I didn't want to just make one little section. Maybe we have your dad in part to thank for when you all get an Oscar for this film. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to say that this was an incredibly educational documentary for me because I suppose like Lisa and like many dancers, I trained pre-professionally in ballet and then shifted to contemporary and kept studying contemporary when I was in London. And my only exposure to jazz really was through both musical theater and possibly commercial dance contexts. So learning about the the very rich history and the different manifestations that jazz has taken, including the history and um, sort of the process of appropriation and commercialization of the form was incredibly informative. And especially coming from a dance background, I felt that I had the opportunity to reframe my own training in the context of this history. Each of you comes from a dance background, and even in a short run so far, the film's received a very enthusiastic reception from the dance community. Like, I've, uh, I've screening in San Francisco, and there's so many people who are absolutely raring to go to see this film. So, But what do you hope that someone who might not be familiar with dance uh, gets out of this documentary? I think maybe a respect and an understanding, and the... I think dance in all of its forms is never seen as a political act, yet throughout history, it's been so aligned with like some of the greatest moments in, in our political history. And also the way that arts is funded and stuff, they need to see it as a real engine for change. And not just jazz dance, ballet, contemporary, modern, all of these things, tap dance are all kind of been those engines. And so I just want, hopefully non-dancers will respect dance more. I'll never forget, you know, doing my degree in dance. And when everyone said, you you know, you're doing a degree, they just look at you like, well, that's nothing, that there's nothing to a degree in dance. You're just fanning around in a dance studio. And it's like, no, no, no. It was about sociology. It was about all of these things, criticism, analysis. It was, you know, without studying dance, you um, you can't see the value in it. And so, yeah, I really hope that non-dancers take dance seriously and we start to see from that money being poured into it for everybody to kind of benefit from it, really. I've always been of the school of thought that I think jazz dance, dance as a whole, but I definitely think jazz dance because it comes from such a social, uh, cultural background. I think I think jazz dance has the possibility to bring us together as human beings um, and, and dance together and, and be together in social circumstances. Um, and I think that is just a beautiful thing. And if that can happen to dancers and non-dancers alike, I think wow, that, that, that's important. And that's always been a kind of uh, a, a cool starting point for me. Let's, let's bring together humanity because jazz dance brings together so many different influences from various different cultures and various different social circumstance. Um, and it's just a beautiful thing. Kadifa's always said that it's, it's the inclusivity of it that we wanted to really get across. So, um, and again, that's quite timely right now because I think that's so important um, in society. Um, so I think that that's my, my so that was my main my main thing is the inclusivity of the whole picture, of the bigger picture. Yeah. I think it has the potential to to really keep the interest. Um, of someone that's not necessarily a just a dancer. I don't think it's just a dance film. And this week, because we're at the Rhode Island International Film Festival, that's not a dance, you know. So it'll be really interesting, the kind of response we get. It was nice to start off in a dance film festival because, you know, you're a bit more secure, although you know you're kind of going to never please everybody. 
this is like, oh, what, what are the normal people going to say? <laughs> so, yeah. I was, I was gushing in our conversation with Hannah, like, that I can't see how normal people might, that aren't dance people wouldn't see such incredible value in this film because it is so rich in the history and the social cultural context. And I, I just love how the film, it doesn't feel like, I mean, I love lectures, don't get me wrong, but it doesn't feel like a lecture or like a history class. It very, it has like a lot of choreography woven throughout. It has, um, it moves quickly enough. So I just think that as far as the production is concerned, like take the content aside, like even the way that it's structured, I think it's very accessible and it's not dumbed down. It's just very clear. And I I do have a good feeling that it's going to do well with a general audience. Do you see this going into universities? Do you see this going into a professional context? What other forms might this film take or um, or evolve into? Yeah, I mean, we've got, we've always got big plans. Um, but <laughs> one of the things is, um, obviously, we're still navigating our distribution um, deals, and we haven't landed on anything yet. Um, but festivals are first, which is the rest of this year, probably early next, and then ideally, we'll get it out uh, globally. Um, but we want that educational branch because we've had a lot of interest, of course, and we, so we want to get it out to the universities and college and for it to be available. But we'd also love, in a way, to back the film. We we discussed this probably two years ago, I think, um, to have, be it a non-profit or just like a branch off of the film, <laughs> pardon the pun, um, is, <laughs> is, is, is a, like a, is a company that kind of gets funded. So it keeps going. So it keeps, it's backing up what the film is talking about and it can deliver. Cause some people be like, well, I can't get a Luigi class or I haven't, I've never taken African dance. And so we then can try and facilitate workshops, be it monthly, quarterly in, and can facilitate and get, we kind of then get the experts to them. Um, so we'd love to kind of continue that. So it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it has, it's backing the film in a way, in a practical way. That's, I mean, that's a love of mine. We'd also love to develop an episodic because there's so much that we know we only just touched on or didn't even touch on at all. There's many people that are like, but what about this person? And I'm like, yeah, and the film couldn't be four hours long. So we had to, you know, we had to make some tough decisions. But, um, you know, we wanted to do a whole section on jazz music and talk to like Winston Marcellus and Quincy Jones and you know we wanted to do that but you know money time timing um yeah. but you know we already have all these ideas to expand all that and that again would be amazing educationally as well as for everybody oh my gosh that's that's going to change the culture and that's going to definitely um be such a positive effect on the current and next generation so this is Obviously a huge project and I'm sure that you will you will never regain all those lost hours of sleep and the stress and thank you for talking with us today about it and sharing some some branches and some fruits from this uh from this project. Can I say one thing just to say thank you because I just want to thank all the contributors that were involved and the dancers that we filmed and the studio people that let us film for free light at Steps and BDC and many other places, obviously our crew, but um, Matt Simpkins, who's our DP, he's been like awesome and amazing even now. He does a lot of, he does all our artwork and is just goes above and beyond. And last but not least, editor Joan Jill Amarin, who is American but lives in London. She, you know, finding her, cause she was on Whitney and I saw Whitney. It's a stroke of genius from Lisa. Yeah, literally just like, uh, I really want those montages. Who did this? Um, and that brought us Joan and Joan and Kadifa are just like besties now as well. <laughs> but we love Joan. So um, I, I, I always want to like mention, because, you know, of course, uh, had a hand yeah. in what we have. Of course. And it feels that way too. Like even talking to the three of you and, and when we all saw you at Los Angeles Dance Film Festival, way back when like there's just such great energy around 
uh, around this project. And I think it kind of embodies what what the the message of the film is, which is, you know, humanity sharing, um, being a, being willing to have those conversations and do the research and and, you know, not just share your perspective, but refine your perspective. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, yeah. Jen. Thank oh, you course. so much. Well, going into another feature film, um, we're going to go into the documentary Uprooted, which we had a special opportunity to watch. This film right now is being featured at some film festivals and getting some great recognition on it. Last year, Jen gave us the opportunity to just share the trailer at Cascadia and Capitol Dance and Cinema Festival. But uh, Jen, you have a little bit more insight of the film than we do. So why don't you introduce Uprooted to the audience? Oh, it would be an honor. So I first encountered this project probably, I would say, like late summer 2018. And I found it on Facebook. I guess like, thank goodness for the Facebook ads algorithm. And at that time, they were crowdfunding. And I was instantly hooked. I said, no way. There's a jazz documentary. And we were just getting plans together for screening American Tap, which already I was like, this is great. A new tap documentary. But jazz is something that is so misunderstood, misappropriated, misremembered that I was just like so thrilled that this was even coming to existence. So since then, like I connected with uh, Lisa Domal Reeve, the producer, and I've been in communication with her, like just trying to see like, where can, where can this film get seen? And like, where's the right audience? So I actually met her in California and I was like, okay, like dance film festivals are like a whole separate world. Like you think a general audience can appreciate this? Like dance film festivals will. And it was so great that the film just had its premiere with Dance on Camera Festival. That's Dance Films Association's festival. It was online, but I think it, you know, would have been great to see it in New York. But the fact that it was online, it became a global event, which is really awesome. So yeah, the the original working title was Transmission Roots to Branches. But now the film's called Uprooted, The Journey of Jazz Dance. And it is an incredible survey of kind of like the original title, The Roots and the Branches. Like, where did jazz dance come from? How has it evolved? How do we remember it? How do we try and make sure that its legacy is carried on in a more um, authentic and accurately contextualized way? And yeah, I mean, I'm just really excited to deep dive into this film with you because there's so much material there from a sociocultural perspective and even just from all the different voices that contribute to it. So, Jen, you... One word that came to me when you were talking was the word survey. I think this is definitely a film that surveys from many, many people. There's so many interviews, so many choreographers, educators, scholars, performers. I I was very impressed with it. But let's focus on the title itself, Uprooted. Why is this title appropriate for this movie, this story? Why do you think it's appropriate? Well, I like it. And especially compared to the original title, Transmission, I think it's a much more appropriate title for this film. And also, I think it's a total credit to the filmmakers in their process of creating the film. I think the original title, Roots to Branches, it does imply a sort of like a beginning and an ending point, but it very much implies a very well-defined path from inception to to blooming from beginning to end. Whereas uprooted signifies that, you know, what we have known, like what we know about our our origins and their manifestations is there's something missing there. There's something that's uh, not accounted for. There's history that's not being told. And we really have to uproot what we're familiar with in order to flesh out these histories and bring new light to jazz. Study it. Definitely. I like the word uprooted. I get like a visceral reaction to it. You know, I this this word's so overused, but I'm going to use it. It's very raw. It feels very raw. It feels like kind of messy. Like if you think about a tree that's been uprooted or like the million weeds that I'm pulling out of my yard right now, like it, it looks messy and it is messy. And it's such an apt title for this because 
even by the end of the film, there are these contradictions and you really just have to decide for yourself or admit that we don't know fully. And all we can do is continue to try and investigate and, and try and do the best that we can in our, in our own individual contexts. It's an ever evolving style of movement. For those who don't know jazz, it's, you might have seen it through a form that is not maybe characterized as jazz, uh, maybe something called contemporary, which is a very, uh, we could say a selling word for dancers who want to go into dance or just anybody who's interested in dance as a movement. But yeah, I mean, what I've learned from this documentary and with its title is it doesn't come from just one thing. It comes from many things. And when I think of something that is uprooted, it's continuous. You know, it it, it comes from the ground, but there's more to then what we just see. They talk about things that are missing. They talk about things that have changed. It's evolving. From an overall audience standpoint, it's just, I mean, there's so many good quotes and I don't want to be like quoting the movie the entire time, but there was near the end, like the beginning and the end, there's sort of these montages of just these different voices chiming in and, you know, they describe, you know, jazz's conversation, empathy, humanity, no one owns it, but we have a responsibility to attribute it. Like all these different themes that, whether you are a dancer or not, whether you are directly involved with the specific genre of jazz or not, it's just such a, an education and such a window into how these things are carried forward in life and how they're transformed. Bob Ross at the end says, jazz is the history of America. And I just thought that was such a beautiful way to sum it up because, you know, throughout the film, it touches through so many different points in history and um, so many different events that shape and really are part of the human story. And, you know, I'd be interested in even how things continue to evolve. Like, what if there's another uprooted and another 50 years being made? And how how are things continuing to change? And with all that change, we got a lot of different people speaking about that change. One thing that we've noticed about this film is there's like a lot of talking heads. There's a lot of dance and then there's a lot of talking heads. And for those who don't study film, a talking head is just basically an interview with someone who's sitting in a chair or standing or whatever they're doing. They're still and they're just telling the story, what they have to say about it. So would we say that this film was effective with its use of the talking head? I think it had good variety. Yeah, I think so too. For sure. It wasn't like some people were talking, standing, different locations. And also there was, you know, we can talk about it maybe a little bit after this, but the use of of dance and movement and that was shot specifically for this film as sort of these segments as well. Yeah, I thought it was very effective too. And I think... What, they got had something like 70 interviewees for this film, which is kind of insane. For something like that, it's tricky with dance documentaries because fundamentally you're using text and you're using voice and in interviews to communicate something that's told through the body. So there's a lot of discussion as to whether this is an appropriate method to convey the history of the development of a dance form. And if I, if I do have any critique about the movie, it's that I would have wanted to see more dancing and I would have wanted to see more, more demonstrations of sort of jazz at its different stages of iteration and different, different periods of practice. Like I thought that some of the moments, like when Camille Brown was doing the jube, I thought that was a very effective moment too. And it's something I would have loved to see more of. Yeah, for a movement-based film, I agree. I would love to see more dancing. I thought... There was like a lot of historical historical documentation of the evidence that they're talking about. I mean, you see the mathematics method, you see the Luigi method all being performed, but it would have been nice to see Miss Mathematics uh, to actually demonstrate it and like go, actually go through the method herself. I mean, I understand we were watching classes, which is fantastic. I love that we were able to see like a modern day class of this method that was developed in like... 70s 80s to be performed and broken down in that way but I was impressed with how much was given to us 
and how much of it actually survived, you know, through the archival process. I really, I, I do want to shout out, there are a few sequences that, the one part where they're talking about Jack Cole and the Eastern dances, like they, they didn't have an example of a class that they showed. So they, they had to like create the class. They did a very quick, like eight or 16 count. And I appreciated that, like that was thrown in there. Cause otherwise it would just have been like a mention without context. And for some of these, like we, we might get the video, we might get the photo, we might not, but I agree. Like definitely seeing the movement is such a huge part of it. But I do think there were some sequences where you have this this dance as the voice to kind of give you that emotional delivery at the end. Like, particularly at the end of the film, they do a match cut with, we see um, throughout the film, this, this slave dancer, and it's a solo female dancing. And we see that cut directly to, I think when they were at Decidedly Jazz Dance Works, shout out Canada. They do a soup, like a, a match cut from, just it's such it's so well matched with the choreography and that just hit me on such an emotional level where I was like oh like you can actually see the movement transmitting you know you can see the movement and how it flows from one time to another and I think that's why this is so effective as documentary it'd be one thing to show like a performance showing the movement's progression through time but that would I feel like this boils it down so succinctly. And I, don't get me wrong. It would be great to see a live show showing all sorts of vernacular jazz and like different, you know, with tap. And and that was an issue that actually came up, especially near the end as they were like rounding out the, the present day context. That fact that there isn't as much funding for jazz. And like you mentioned, Hannah, like contemporary is kind of like kidnapped. <laughs> and then, of course, there's I'm sure we'll talk about this multiple times today, like the, the ballet factor and the Eurocentrism factor and even just the different way that things are codified and how different communities define ownership. And there's just so much going on. I, I love it. And it is a challenge because it's like, how do we show all this dance with that, but also the information so that we know what's going on? It's just, it's so hard to strike a balance. Going into the history of it, you talked about ballet. I mean. It's interesting as we all are dancers and those who are listening who have dance experience, you start out with ballet and ballet is, they say, the backbone of all dance. And in this case, they say it's like a mix between it's either one person saying, yes, it's a it's the backbone while others are saying, no, jazz, it's all in the heart. It's all in the soul. We don't it doesn't need ballet. What is your take on how this film displays ballet and jazz as a, I guess, a unit? Dancers and just the dance world in general is just kind of a series of fractured lineages. And and this crosses just a wide spectrum of technique and and performance. And there's that quote towards the end of the movie, like where like nobody, nobody really communicates with each other. And I think that that kind of runs so that's got kind of lack of communication so pervasive. And I started out doing pre-professional ballet training and then studied contemporary when I was in college. And really my only context that I ever had personally for jazz was either in musical theater or commercial contexts. And growing up, that's how it was kind of sold to me, like through you know professors and for um, through teachers that that was that was something that was commercial and that was you know oh, okay that's fun but this is you know sort of like the high art stuff. This is the academic. This is you know history. Yeah, to, totally negates a whole bunch of uh, complicated and very rich history that there is to this form. And I mean, furthermore, upholds a sense of as you said Eurocentrism too. There's an article that many people have circulated, like, are college dance curriculums too white? And, I mean, so many of them have ballet and contemporary as, like, main courses and usually, I mean, American-based forms like tap, hip-hop, and jazz as electives. Yeah, I feel like even if it's not intentional, it certainly exists. You know, this Eurocentrism, even the idea that ballet is is the foundation of all dance, it's not because it's not all dance. Dance is so different. There are so many different kinds of dance. Like to even just pick one out of the probably thousand type of dance is is absolutely incorrect, right? Which is why it's so important to 
have films like this and have conversations like this where we really try and look at our, how are things remembered and how are things carried forward. And something that I really like that this film does is it separates out that there's this street and this social dance aspect of jazz that is where jazz came from. But then you have the the pedagogy and you have the studios. And this is something that as someone that like teaches in dance studios and is involved in the competition world, like I see all the time is jazz is just, you ask, I ask my class all the time, like, what is jazz to you? And the the little ones, even sometimes the teenagers that have not had me for years will say, it's sassy, it's confident. And it's like, you have no clue if you're just saying it's sassy or it's upbeat. Jazz is so dynamic. And I think that a big part of the issue is that there's so many different ingredients that go into it. And some of it is uncomfortable to talk about that it just doesn't become part of the conversation. And studios uh, end up training uh, dancers to compete. And, you know, the, the, the documentary touches on this at the end, looking at like the network television shows and the fact that things just become about trickery and intensity. I thought it was really ironic, though, that the one historian said Catherine Dunham in her time, part of why she didn't get taken seriously, even though she was an anthropologist originally, part of why she didn't get taken seriously was that her work was sensual. So it wasn't really considered uh, academic. And the ironic thing is I feel like things have done a 180 now where even children's dance is very hypersexualized. And it's not that we don't take it seriously. It's like, oh, those, those kids are going to get work. And like you, like you mentioned, Claire, Melanie George said that it wasn't her. She said that she credited her friend with saying that it's get a job jazz. So we run into this issue of like different worlds of jazz existing, one which is more authentic to the roots and one which is more focused on training with a certain goal in mind that is completely not part of what jazz should be or is. And jazz honestly should be, I don't know, a celebration in my opinion. I mean, it's just celebration of the body and the music that it emulates. I don't understand why it has to turn into this thing of trickery and money making because, I mean, I understand that dance is sometimes a little underpaid. Uh, It's not as popular as some other work and they go to options that can make money. And in the future, we'll discuss some of those topics in depth. But I think what really opened my eyes about this film of jazz is just like it's a regional kind of thing it's not just one thing it's all it's a number and again connecting back to that title it can't be it shouldn't be codified there needs to be a mid-ground there needs to be somewhere where we can both it's like how they kept saying we need to sprinkle in the history to teach people. We have to honor it, but we also need to share it. You know, there's respect and share and that needs to come together. And I agree with that completely. Yeah. And generally, if I feel that something's attached to a specific person and specifically like a specific male patriarchal figurehead, then it becomes more of a cult of personality than it does a technique. And I think that it's important to understand that a lot of people talk about, okay, here is authentic. This is like authentic in one certain practice. And so, yeah, so with regards to the authenticity, again, I think it was Melanie who said that um, you have to acknowledge the origin of where you got it from. And I think that when it comes, when you're describing any kind of dance style, it's impossible to say anything is, I mean, something is authentically jazz. I mean, in some ways it's, it's kind of a misnomer to say like, you know, there's one, only one way of teaching ballet or like there's only one way of potentially teaching this material, but it's so, it so heavily relies on uh, the intention of the teaching and the intention of the, um, of the practice itself. And then it, when it comes, you know, it's it, extremely codified and it becomes, it revolves around these certain names, then it becomes more of like a cult of personality in that it's, you know, really in service to like this one person who's almost deified as, rather than the actual practice of the movement itself. We're in that space where I'm trying to define what are these different ends of the spectrum here. And, you know, at the end of the film, uh, the same professor, Thomas de France, he says 
that almost in a, and I may be incorrect here, but it's almost like a lament where it's like, you know, because this codification and because this um, kind of individual ownership wasn't part of the black experience with jazz as much as it was with certain white leaders, they then, the, the black community then loses out on access, opportunity, fame, financial gain. And I'm just, it's curious to, okay, how do we make it right then? And if we're saying that we we want this communal sharing and we don't want it to be, we don't want it to be commercial by by the current rules. And honestly, like, I, I think that if something is is dance and like made for the masses, it's usually not the best. It's usually not the deepest. It's usually not the most intellectual. I mean, it's like fast food. It's cultural fast food. And something I do struggle with is there were multiple voices saying the plus side of this is that dance is being seen. And I just think it's kind of bittersweet because, and this will come up when we do our TikTok episode, like I want the bar to be higher. I don't want it to just be oh, people are looking at dance, but it's like, what kind of representation of dance is it? You know, I just, I I hope that this film gets seen and I hope that, you know, people continue to just learn and connect and find ways to really just be more responsible with all the choices we're making and what we're elevating. And that really goes on a pop culture level too. And again, that goes into like actively viewing and passively viewing. You know, as we watch dance, the common audience, they're just going to be watching it passively. They're just enjoying it for what it is. But no one's sitting there really questioning what the movement is about. That's rare. Yeah. And that honestly, that feels like, a, and it is objectification to me in a way. It's very superficial. If you're just watching dance to like watch the people move or like, oh, look at their bodies or they're so fit. Like it's actually part of why I have just stopped performing. Like it, it's just, it there's always going to be those people. And for me, I was like, it's not worth it dealing with those people for me to feel like less of a human being. Let me focus on ideas and other things. I know for other dancers, that's not as big of a problem. And like, kudos to you, you're winning. But yeah, it's such a challenge to try and get audiences to take dance seriously, which is why I get so bothered when kind of like trash is just put out there. And then we're like, oh, it's good though, because people are at least seeing dance. Well, with all this in mind, how do you think this film would resonate for a non-oriented dance crowd? Dance, non-dance oriented crowd. Yeah, it's tough to say. I mean, obviously this is so resonant with the dance community and anybody who is even sort of marginally involved in the community knows who half the people talking in the film are and can really get something out of it. But to have someone who's completely new to dance just watching this documentary, like say this documentary came up on like, you know, a PBS station or something, like would it necessarily cause someone to sit and get themselves drawn in if they weren't so familiar with it? Yeah, that's that's tough to say. It has a very, very particular and very enthusiastic niche in the dance film community as is, but but yeah, it's hard to really gauge what the general audience... I mean, again, like the the, the general audience would have to be very involved in watching the whole the whole thing to get something tangible out of it i feel that this film could do very well on streaming right now we're in a place of anyone is watching anything on netflix and i think it could do well specifically on netflix because of how things are working these days you can watch the trailer easily you have a freaking dynamite kind of cover on it And people will click it. I mean, I think it has a great title. I think it plays a nice story. And people will actually watch it. Because right now we're in a digital age of destination watching. Where something like PBS, you're only going to get a age demographic that's maybe, maybe 20 something and up. or, Or maybe 30 something and up. I mean, I'm not a big PBS watcher. I mean, I'm slowly dipping my toe into it these days, but it's like as we get older, we're starting to dip into PBS. <laughs> it's funny to say that, but yeah. Uh, but we are in an age of digital watching and places like Netflix that celebrates these kind of offbeat. I don't want to say that dance is offbeat, but 
someone is going to be watching the British Bake Off over a dance film. I'm going to be audit. I'm going to be honest right there. But because we're in that age, people will watch it because we have things that are a little weird. We have like the flower competition these days. We have the makeup competition. I mean, not, not that this is a dance competition. Those already exist on like ABC, but this could work. It could resonate. People will actually learn something and they could catch it at the time that they watch it. I have watched far worse documentaries on topics I've been interested in. Like the amount of B or C grade food documentaries I have watched is something to behold. So I think that the fact that this is so professionally done and like is just a really great film. Like even the opening sequence has a theme. It comes full circle. It's well structured. I think that people that are down to watch a doc will be like, oh yeah, this is a good doc. And the other part of this, is, I think this is such a timely release for this film because literally in 2020, and especially in this early summer of 2020, people are talking about these exact topics. Like I had goosebumps watching this premiere because I was like, wow, this this was the right time for this film to come out because it's always so hard to get, you know, to, to pitch your film, to get people to watch your one thing over like the endless options that are available. And the fact that this resonates so much with what the cultural conversation is globally, I think is amazing. I think that it's going to do really well with the general audience personally, but maybe I'm just like clouded. You know, it's like, You love your own children, no matter how badly they behave. Like, I've just decided that I love this film and that everyone that cares about history at all or these topics at all will still love it. Where do you see that general audience in your perspective, Jen? Because I know you're more of a theater person. I am specifically an online person. Claire, maybe you're in like in between. What do you have to say for that? Where is this audience living? I think it's an excellent just general historic documentary. It's a good arts documentary. So anything that focuses on those niches of documentary is great. So small town theaters, would you say small art house theaters? theaters? Uh, No, I didn't mean by way of theaters. I just meant like kind of platforms where it could go. I also really hope this gets included in schools. You know, like universities, like every university that has a dance program should have this film. Period. Agreed. Agreed. I can anticipate like a whole generation of dancers growing up on this film or growing up having seen this film in like their, you know, dance history 101 course. Yeah. I feel like I'm part of history, like seeing this film premiere. I think I'm in love. (laughs) (laughs) Look out world. But really, yeah. Claire, where do you think this... So like I've said, like I feel that this film could be something really worthy of Netflix's interest. I'm trying to think of like what afterlife of this film would be and to get to the general public, where do you see a film like this? So Jen, you're saying universities, you're saying an arts platform. Well, I'm just trying to think back of documentaries that were foundational to me when I was growing up. Like, I mean, I remember watching, like taking a day in our ballet class to watch Children of Theater Street. And that was a documentary that left a huge impression as well as Ballet Russe, which was like one of those like school organized trips. So I think that this documentary is going to find a huge, huge life in um, in schools and in school curriculums. And considering how timely it is, I think that is going to be coming sooner rather than later. And yeah, and I do think that it does. I mean, I don't want to say like it doesn't have like any general audience appeal. I mean, I'm just thinking like as far as it competing for eyes on, you know, sort of the television and the digital milieu, it might have a a bit of a problem considering it is competing with a lot of different content. But I think that it is like, it is an event film and it is, you know, reaching out to a very, very, very significant section of the dance community that really has been ignored and thrown aside over the years. And I think that it's really going to, it's going to stay with people. I really hope that DVDs somehow come back in fashion. I honestly, like, I don't have a lot of DVDs, but I do invest some money into certain films that I thoroughly enjoy. And I hope this becomes something that people actually put their money into in the future. I mean, those universities are definitely going to purchase a film like this. Those 
teaching studios that value jazz or value dance history of any kind that where honestly I think that dance studios should have their own little rental library where they can get these kind of films to have students have access to honestly I think that would be a such a valuable tool in the future of learning and as well as just compensation for all of these producers, all of these people who are involved in it. I mean, come on, guys. I, this is a public announcement. Bring back the DVD to help artists. And also study guides. So like someone can pick up a study guide and then go down a, on a rabbit hole to whatever artist they want to learn more about and then potentially make a documentary about them in the future. Yeah, for sure. And that's a that's a cool thing about this I didn't even think about is like the fact that it it's such a gateway to so many elements of history and so many people that those are those are seeds right there for someone to to decide, oh, I'm really fascinated by this individual. And that's something I really appreciate at the end of the film where they asked, you know, is there anyone we forgot? And they start naming like Pepsi Patel. And, you know, there was a whole slideshow at the end of different folks that like weren't really even, didn't even come up in the earlier in the film. And, you know, there's so many more names too. I'm just wondering, you know, I would love to see this as like a museum exhibition. Something I really appreciate about this film is that obviously the our audience were learning a lot watching it, but it's also very clear that the filmmakers of the film were learning a lot and using that knowledge to direct how they were going to create the film. Like, and they even, I think you even hear one moment when Kadifa's asking questions and just, um, you almost kind of see them going on a journey as well and just, um, and I really appreciated how um, that openness was really seen throughout the whole film. I mean, there's like so much in this film that I think that it could be a 10-part series, which I think would be really good. There's just that whole section when they say about like, who else did we forget? And if Melanie George came in and just like changed the whole plot... I mean, there's just so much there that it could be, like, honestly, like, a a docuseries that's, like, maybe, you know, it could be an hour episode, you know. And there's just so much to put in there. Like, I felt like this was just scraping. I don't want to say it was completely scraping the surface, but it there was just, it was a dense scoop, you know. I... All of a sudden, we're like, we're starting at the very beginning of like the slave trade and then going into, and then all of a sudden, we're just like in the 60s and the 70s. And I'm like, well, we start at the very beginning with mother and child in heartbeat. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I was like, this is epic. This is so epic. I would love to like hear more about those unsaid names because, you know, we don't have those textbooks that give us all the knowledge of jazz dancing like we do with ballet and modern dance history books. You know, it's still a chain of events that we're kind of just scraping up and figuring out and finding these archival goods that are maybe not in the best shape and condition and finding out who are these people. We're calling up these family members, getting, you know, little knowledge of, of what we can Definitely. And I think that they're, because like the film is structured very well and it's an 85 minute run. And, you know, I feel like it just moves and moves and moves. It's it's very well paced, but there definitely is room to expand on all these segments within the film. I would love a docuseries of this. Like love it and do multiple seasons forever. Hey, it's another Netflix idea, guys. I'm trying to make you guys money. I care. <laughs> well, Netflix is actually based in the town I live in, so I can go like knock on their door and just like <laughs> put up a bunch of posters. Just like leave it at their doorstep with a note and that with, says like, you're welcome. Packet. Yeah. Form, the festival of recorded movement based in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, will be hosting their festival online this year. Films are available from September 12th through the 19th. All information for that festival will be linked in the show notes. (laughs) 
that's our show. Thank you so much for everyone tuning in and listening to our conversation for today. Feel free to follow us on Instagram, which is FrameformPod. That's Frameform, P-O-D. And you can send us an email at FrameformPodcast at gmail.com. If you want to learn more about Uprooted, the journey of jazz dance, see the info in the show notes. Thanks for listening, and we'll be back next week with a new episode. Frameform is a production of Rixie, hosted by me, Hannah Weber, Claire Schweitzer, and Jen Ray. Edited and mixed by myself and Mason Carlton. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next week.